In a game as massive and complicated as The Elder Scrolls Online, there are bound to be things that people get wrong from time to time. I know I have in the past and I'm sure I will more in the future. Maybe it is a mechanic that doesn't work in the way that it would seem logical for it to, or maybe it's one of those rumors that have caught traction that no one bothered to test before spreading around. ESO's knowledge base is mostly community driven, which can make it fun to figure out stuff together, but unfortunately can also lead to people sharing information that is incorrect. Uh, hi, I'm Skinny Cheeks, and this will be my attempt to clean up some misinformation in ESO and get the community on the same page about some of the more common things we keep getting wrong. All right, so first up, let's talk about weapon and spell damage. There is a common misconception with weapon and spell damage increases that don't go on our stat sheet and only affect specific types of damage. So for example, sets like Automaton or War Maiden or the Wrathful Strikes Champion Point node, these don't go on our stat sheet and instead are conditional stat increases to something specific. Compare those to something like Julianos, which just gives a flat stat boost, or the Untamed Aggression Champion Point node that gives a flat stat boost as well. Well, these stats do go on our character sheet. So what I often hear people say is the ones that don't go on your character sheet are not boosted by percent boosts. So things like Major and Minor Sorcery and Brutality, or other percent increases from things like your Medium Armor Pass or Fighter's Guild passives. However, this is not true. The Wrathful Strikes node, Automaton, War Maiden, and all of the sets that have bonuses that are presented in a similar manner do get boosted by those percent boosts. So take War Maiden for example, let's say we have both Major and Minor Sorcery, and then another 10% from our other passives. That 600 weapon and spell damage on the five piece is actually gonna be 840 weapon and spell damage to our magic damage abilities. You don't see this anywhere on the stat sheet, but the increase is there. I've been hearing this incorrect statement made about Wrathful Strikes as well, but it wouldn't make sense at all if it wasn't boosted, as there would never be a reason to run it over the Untamed Aggression node, if only Untamed received those percent modifiers. But they both get boosted, so if you only care about your offensive stats and you don't need the healing, Wrathful Strikes is the stronger option. And yes, I did test this, and it boosts all of your offensive stuff like Light Attack, abilities, proc set damage, etc. So as far as I know, the only form of weapon and spell damage that doesn't get boosted by percent modifiers is the Bloodthirsty Jewelry trade. This was actually something that they commented on in the patch notes when Bloodthirsty was changed to the form it is in today, and midway through the PTS, they actually gave it more weapon and spell damage than it was originally going to have to account for it not being boosted by these modifiers. So I hope that helps to clear up the discussion a little bit about the weapon and spell damage percent boosts. If there are others that are not boosted by the percentage let me know in the comments and I'll make sure to pin something, but I do believe it is only the bloodthirsty trait. All right, the next topic I wanted to cover is dual wield enchantments and traits. I get asked all the time, which hand does X enchantment or trait go on? So for the traits, Nernhoned is the only trait that matters which hand you put it on. This is because our main hand gives us the full weapon and spell damage amount of the weapon equipped in it, and the offhand gives us a reduced value of weapon and spell damage. So when using Nernhoned, which pumps up the value by 15%, we want to make sure it is increasing the value of that main hand, otherwise the bonus it gives is really small. So you can see just equipping a one-handed weapon in the main hand and then moving it to the offhand, we have less overall stats. It seems like this is one of those little things that isn't super clear, but yeah, that is how it works. Any other traits, you can just put on whichever hand you want since all of the other trait bonuses are independent of the weapon used. Infused is a little different as well, but that is more to do with the enchantment side of things, so let's talk about that now. For enchantments, generally that doesn't matter either, with the exception being if you are using an infused weapon. Infused buffs that enchantment specifically, so if you have a certain enchantment you want buffed by the infused trait, you will need to put it on that specific weapon. Some people have made the mistake of thinking that is the case with the charged trait as well, and try and put the enchantment that they want boosted more by charged on that specific hand, but it doesn't work that way. So charge just boosts your overall percentage to apply status effects in general. General, so it doesn't make any difference what enchantment is on that specific charged weapon. So for example, if I had a Nernhone and charged weapon equipped and I'm using poison and flame for my enchantments, it doesn't matter which goes on which hand. Charged will still boost their chance to proc their respective status effects equally. 
All right, another topic I see some confusion around is cast time versus channeled abilities. They are very similar because they both take your character and lock them into an ability for a specific duration of time. But the key difference is that in a cast time ability, nothing is happening during that time period and then an effect goes off at the end. So a few examples of this are uppercut and its morphs, snipe and its morphs, and the sorcerer ability crystal fragments. All of these have a duration that you have to wait and then the ability goes off. On the other hand, with a channeled ability, something is happening during that period where you are locked into the skill. Some examples of channeled abilities are the Templar's Puncturing Strikes ability and its morphs, the Templar's Radiant Destruction ability and its morphs, and the Dual Wield Spammable Flurry and its morphs. If you check your skill tooltips, generally they will tell you if it is a cast time or a channeled ability. This topic seems to come up a bit with the set Deadly Strike because it says it boosts damage over time and channeled abilities. And this is accurate, but often people include those cast time skills in that channeled category, and that is not accurate. So Deadly Strike will not boost cast time abilities, but it will boost the channeled abilities and all damage over time abilities. So once again, easy way to remember for cast time, you do nothing during the timer while you are casting, and then something happens. For channeled, there is a specific action that you are channeling during that timer and then the action ends when the timer runs out. All right, the next topic I wanted to cover is how does swapping which bar you are on affect the damage or healing output of the abilities that you cast? So you've probably seen that it's pretty common to run your area of effect or AOE damage over time effects on your back bar where your stats are generally a little lower and your single target damage over time effects on your front bar where your stats are usually a little higher. Well, one of the big reasons we set up this way is because AOE abilities update to your current stats with each tick, whereas single target dots will snapshot the stats from when they are cast. This is true for both damaging and healing abilities. So if I cast an ability like Mystic Orb on my back bar, as soon as I swap to my front bar, I'm now getting my front bar stats with each tick of Mystic Orb. So it doesn't really hurt the ability much to have it slotted on the back bar since it's gonna update when we swap anyways. This is also a big reason why most PVE setups don't run lightning staves on the back bar. It may seem like a good idea since the lightning staff boosts your AOE abilities. However, as soon as you swap to your front bar, you are getting the stats from your front bar regardless and the lightning staff is then only giving you an inferior wall of elements compared to the flame version. The flame one deals 20% more damage to burning enemies and also is boosted by buffs like engulfing flames and Incratus. Plus your light attacks will hit harder on your back bar as well if you have a flame staff one. So that's why we generally don't go with the lightning back bar even if you do have all of your AoEs there. Now let's talk about the single target dots. They do work a little differently. Say something like degeneration. If you slot it on your front bar, it will snapshot to your stats from when you cast it. And then when you are reapplying your dots on your back bar, it will still be ticking for the amount that it should be with those front bar stats. And the same would be true if I had it slotted on my back bar and I cast it and then swapped to my front bar. And when I say stats, I'm referring to your weapon and spell damage and your maximum resource, so your stamina or magicka. Crit chance and crit damage and other percent done modifiers will still update dynamically even for these single target abilities. So let's keep with degeneration as our example. If I have it slotted on my back bar, the whole duration of the dot will deal damage based on that spell damage and max magicka that I have on my back bar, even if I immediately swap to the front bar after I cast it. However, like I mentioned a second ago, crit chance and crit damage will still update dynamically, so if those are higher on the front bar, we still benefit from those extra stats there. So so it isn't a huge deal to have a single target dot on the back bar, but just know that you do miss out on a little bit of damage from it that way. But sometimes it is still better to do overall based on what other skills you might need on the front bar. And this works with healing too. Let's take Resolving Vigor for example. This is a single target heal, so if I cast it on a bar with higher stats, then swap to a bar with lower stats, I'll still get the higher heal ticks from it. And then vice versa if I cast it on a bar with lower stats and swap to one with higher. But again, remember the stats here with Vigor would just be weapon damage and max stamina. So something like a powered trait that boosts healing by a percentage, it's still only going to be active when you are on that bar. And so it doesn't matter if you cast an ability like Vigor on that bar specifically or not. It will only give you that percent boost when you are on that bar. 
So I think that pretty much covers that section. Hopefully it wasn't too confusing. It is a bit nuanced. Maybe watch through it one more time if you found it to be a lot to take in. But the general rule of thumb is that AoEs update dynamically and single target abilities snapshot to the weapon and spell damage and max resource for the time that they are cast. There are some small exceptions to this rule like Poison Injection, which will update all of its stats dynamically the way an AoE does, even though it's a single target dot. But I think that's more because it also works as an execute, so it has to constantly keep seeing what health percentage the enemy is at, so it updates dynamically on both fronts. But I hope that helps a bit to clear up how that mechanic works behind the scenes. And then finally, the last topic I wanted to cover in this video is animation canceling. This is one that can be a bit confusing to newer players, but really at its core is not actually very complicated. Most of the time, we aren't really doing anything special to cancel our animations. It just naturally occurs with the optimal way to engage in combat. So essentially, abilities have animations that tend to last for longer than those abilities are actually performing any sort of action. ESO works on a one second global cooldown system where you can't cast any skills quicker than one per second. However, with the exception of a few cast times and channels, which we went over earlier, abilities won't last longer than that one second period anyways, so ideally our combat will revolve around casting ability as close to once per second as possible. In many MMOs, the auto attack is something that does what the name suggests. It automatically triggers when you are in the correct range for its conditions, and you only worry about the abilities that you press. With ESO though, the auto attacks are instead our light and heavy attacks, which we perform manually with the left click on the mouse or right trigger on the controller. The key thing though is these do not share the same cooldown as our abilities and therefore with each ability we press we can sneak in a light attack in front of it. So essentially what we end up doing is every one second we press our light attack then ability, light attack then ability, light attack and ability and so on. And the quicker you can get those both crammed into casting every one second and not waiting any longer the more optimal your combat rotation will be. So most of the time this is the way that we are actually animation canceling. We're just starting the next light attack and ability but before the animations from the previous ability are finished, so it actually ends up not being quite as confusing as it might initially sound. But there are a few other ways you can cancel your animation too. Blocking is a common one, as well as bar swapping, roll dodging, and bashing. Essentially, as long as the ability is an instant cast ability and not a channel or a cast time, you can cast the ability and it will do what it's supposed to do, even if you immediately cancel that animation out with a block, a bar swap, a roll dodge, or a bash. So it is good to get into the habit when you are going to be bar swapping before your next ability you cast. As soon as you're done pressing the buttons for that last light attack and ability on the front bar, you will immediately bar swap. And then when the one second global cooldown is finished, you are already there and ready for your next light attack and ability on that bar. With practice, you can seamlessly swap back and forth between your bars without needing to wait for full animations to play out. This just comes with practice really, but the key one that most people get hung up on is just casting your light attacks and abilities once per second. If you are doing it fast enough, the animations will naturally cancel themselves. Before we go, I did also want to mention the end game help menu. I don't think a lot of people even know it exists, and those who do might not know that it actually has a lot of relevant information. So for example, if you are confused on status effects and you are wondering what each one of them do or how you activate them, all of that info is actually right inside your game in the help menu. It lists each one out and shows their specific effects and what types of abilities trigger them and with what percent chance they can be applied. So really great info there. Just wanted to know this as well sometimes the answer to something you may be unsure of could be just a quick search away within the in-game menu so i hope that clears up some of the topics i've seen some confusion or misinformation on sorry about my voice today i am getting over being sick but hopefully it wasn't too bad to listen to Thank you so much for watching. I hope this video was helpful. I would love to do more videos like this one and keep them on the shorter side so they aren't too much info to take in at once. Definitely let me know in the comments if there are topics you've often seen others puzzled over or just flat out misinformed on and I'll do my best to cover them. A big thanks to my current Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see how you can help support the channel through Patreon, I'll have a link in the description below. And a special thanks to Nicholas, Simon, Privy League Guild on PlayStation's EU server, Cougar is Bay in the Cougar City Guild, The Order of War Guild, Iffy, Cantankerous Cat, Shady, Blakewin816, and my wonderful wife. See you guys in the next one. Uh, bye.